Hello and welcome once again to Coding in My Sleep. As usual, I'm your host David Perry, but today you were looking at a computer booting up instead of my smiling face because we are building a cold storage system. Now, first things first, there are a couple of common problems that you may run into during the installation process, and I just want to go ahead and show you a few of those right off the bat so that if you encounter them, you'll know what to do without us having to interrupt the video. This first one is the installer indicating that unsafe swap space has been detected. What that means is that you're about to create some encryption keys, and those are supposed to be stored in memory, but because of the way your system is set up to handle virtual memory, swap space, they may accidentally end up on the hard drive in a way that could lead to a future attack. Obviously, this is a bad thing, so your system is going to halt the entire install process and force you to fix it before you can continue. Uh, you may also see this glitch, which is stuck at init ramfs, which is part of the startup process. Usually this just means that you've burnt a bad disk or you've, you've made a bad USB stick and you need to make another one. Uh, this, similarly, is a horrific graphics glitch that almost certainly indicates that we've just burned a bad disk. Uh, you can avoid these errors by simply using the, the MD5 or, or SHA checksums that are readily available from the distributors of these disks. Now as for the unsafe swap space, if you encounter this error, and if you're using an Ubuntu-based distribution, you almost certainly will, what you need to do is instead of going to the install menu, you need to boot up into live mode and then run this command and then run the installer. It's fairly simple. All you're doing is telling your computer to just not use swap at all. It's unnecessary for the installation process. Maybe you could make things go a little faster, but strictly speaking, you should be fine just turning it off. Now I'm going to fast forward through a lot of this because it is a pretty basic installation process, but you should be aware that because I'm fast forwarding through all of the clicking continue and waiting on progress bars and accepting defaults, that this video represents the process, not the time required to create a cold storage system. Now with this system, we will have a couple of decisions to make about internet connectivity, but we'll discuss that a little bit later on in the video. For now, let's just go ahead and stay offline. Now there are only a few places in this installer that we're not going to accept the defaults, and this is one of them. We're going to check this box here to encrypt our Ubuntu installation, and it'll automatically enable LVM since LVM is a required dependency of that encryption process. We'll enter a nice secure password for disencryption and click the button, and that error we were talking about at the beginning about the unsafe swap space, if you're going to get it, this is the place you're going to get it. Now here the installer is asking us to set a computer name, a username, choose a password, and a whole bunch of basic security options that pretty much every operating system installer asks for. Most of these are fairly inconsequential. What is important is that we set a good strong password here, and we're also going to check this little checkbox to opt for home folder encryption. We're doing this because the home folder is where most software keeps its settings, and that does include Electrum's wallet file. So the hard disk will be encrypted, and then the folder containing our wallet will also be encrypted separately. Now from here on out, the installer pretty much does its own thing. So in the interest of time, we're going to fast forward through some of the boring stuff. Alright, so the installation process is finished. Now we're going to boot up our system for the very first time. First, we've got to enter our disk encryption password to even boot the system at all. And now we're entering the password for our user, and this step is actually decrypting the home folder where our wallet will eventually live once it's been created. Alright, so our operating system is installed, our system is booted, we've gotten through all of the encryption, now we have to make a couple of important decisions. We have a problem to solve. We need to get Electrum onto this machine, and there are a whole bunch of ways to do it. Now the first time I built a system like this, I grabbed the Electrum package off their website, and I went and got some, some installation packages for the couple of dependencies they listed, threw them on a flash drive, and plugged them in, just like I'm showing you now. Simple, right? Except that those dependencies also have dependencies, and the dependencies of the dependencies have dependencies, and you, know, you get the idea. It goes on forever. It's turtles all the way down. 
Now, there are tools explicitly for this sort of thing, but depending on the amount of money you're storing here, it may not be worth the effort. I have an idea of about how much money this thing has to protect, and so I've decided for the sake of time and for the sake of my sanity to take a very small calculated risk. Now I've got a pretty cool, fairly expensive router, and part of what that bought me is the ability to have a full-blown IP tables based firewall on the router. So what I've done is I've gone into my router and I've blocked all communications except with the servers specified in sources.list. Essentially, everything under ubuntu.com and the couple of other places that we're actually going to pull software from. This may be overkill for your scenario. You may be able to just directly connect to the internet without much to worry about, but this step makes what I'm about to do a whole lot safer. If you can manage it, I highly recommend it. So all I've done is I've connected to my extremely limited version of the internet. I'm updating apt-gets repositories and I'm installing Electrum exactly the way that the website tells me to. There's no private keys on this system just yet. There's no wallet for anyone to steal. So as long as nothing I do here results in any kind of virus or spyware infection, I should be okay. Under no circumstances are you to ever use the web browser on this computer, don't check your email. All we're doing here is installing software and immediately disconnecting from the internet. It's also probably worth noting that this entire problem exists only because Electrum on Linux specifically is fairly difficult to install offline. On other platforms, Electrum is much easier to install offline, and other wallet software may be easier to install on Linux. With this in mind, at least one friend of mine uses a small MacBook Air as his cold storage system since the installation process of Electrum on a Mac is dramatically easier and absolutely does not require internet access. It's also worth noting that even if I did just accidentally compromise this system, we'd probably still spot that compromise with just a tiny bit of diligence in the transaction step. More on that in the next video. And here I've forgotten that pip also requires internet access, so I've gone and added python.org to my router's whitelist and rerun the command so that it will actually complete. There's still nothing to lose yet because there is no wallet on this system. So, Electrum is installed. We're going to disconnect from the internet for the last time ever. This computer will never see the internet again. Sad. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and create a desktop shortcut here for convenience in the future, and we're going to launch Electrum for the very first time. We're going to tell Electrum that we would like to create a new wallet, and we are now officially in the danger zone. This is an Electrum seed. Electrum is a deterministic wallet, and it's going to generate more addresses from this seed forever. This seed, essentially, is the private key to every address you will ever hold. If this gets compromised, it's game over. If you lose this, you lose everything. Now this is why I wasn't particularly concerned with our internet connectivity during the install process. This seed never existed until we clicked that button. And when we clicked that button, we were offline. As long as we keep this system offline, it doesn't even really matter that much if there's a virus or malware of some kind on it trying to steal your wallet because it has no means with which to communicate the contents of your wallet back to its creator. Now there are a couple of ways that this could be compromised that we could still end up losing coins, but you can catch those with a little bit of diligence, which as I previously mentioned will be part of the next video, the transaction process. Now I'm not actually going to use this seed, this is my brother-in-law's netbook, and I didn't want to have to blur things out and run the risk of accidentally storing a copy of the video with an intact QR code, it, it's a big crazy security mess. So I'm going to blow away this key and create a whole new one before I ship this thing out, but if we were going to use this, it would be very very important to make a copy of this key, write it down somewhere, back it up someplace safe. It's such an important step that Electrum is actually going to make you type this key back in in the next step just to make sure you actually wrote it down. 
I'm going to skip that step, though, since this is also an opportunity to show you how to restore from just such a backup. It's fairly easy. You just choose the appropriate option and type in the words. Now, whether you're creating a new seed or you're restoring from an existing one, you're going to want to encrypt your wallet, and for that, we'll need one more good, strong password. This means that you will need physical access to the device as well as knowledge of these three specific passwords in order to gain access to your funds. Barring that, you can recover your funds from a backup, which you did make, right? Now, depending on your installation process and what version of Electrum you're using, it may or may not inform you, like this one just has, that we are offline and that since there's no internet connection, it has no way of telling which addresses may or may not be in use and that those may differ from what the default interface shows us. And for an intentionally offline system, that's not a big deal. We're never going to see balances here anyway because without a connection, there's no way to ever tell what the balances are. So we're just going to click OK and move on. Now we're almost finished, all we've got to do is prepare our online system, and for that we're going to need a copy of the master public key. You remember how I said that your seed generates a sort of infinite stream of private keys? Well, your master public key generates an infinite stream of public keys that correspond to those private keys. The math is a little out of scope for this video, but suffice it to say, it's pretty brilliant. Now normally you have to create the public key from the private key, and in an offline system that's problematic. The master public key in this case is how your online system is going to know what addresses belong to your offline system. Now while the master public key cannot be used to gain access to your funds in any way, it can be used to make a big list of every Bitcoin address that you could possibly ever use in the future. So this can lead to a loss of privacy if it's compromised. If you're worried about keeping your transaction secret, treat this key accordingly. It should be considered its own special kind of secret that can lead to just a slightly different kind of loss than a financial one. Now, if you've managed to make it this far, I feel pretty confident that I don't have to walk you through installing Electrum on your online computer. It's a pretty straightforward process. It's the same as installing any other piece of software, really. Importing the master public key is also a fairly simple affair. All you have to do is access the settings menu using the icon at the bottom right, go to the import tab, and select master public key. Then import the public key from the text file that we just created in the tutorial. Sadly, that's all the time that I've got for today, so learning to use our new toy will have to wait for yet another video. Thanks for watching everyone, and I would like to remind you all once more that Coding in My Sleep is completely donation supported, so if you've gotten anything out of this video, I'd like to encourage you to send any tips or donations you feel appropriate to the QR code on the screen. I'd also like to remind you that this QR code is unique to this piece of content, which means that by sending in donations, you're not just funding my work, you're also telling me what it is that you liked. Thanks everybody, and vote with your wallet. Side note, if you think that was an obscene amount of work to go through just to keep your money safe, you're absolutely right. Come on, hardware manufacturers, make something already. Hardware wallets should exist, and they should save us from all of this work. Please.